Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome back on the 25th anniversary of their national championship season, the 1987 Miami Hurricanes. We talk about it as a game of inches. And then we put together that season where we were just, just about perfect. In 86, we had probably the most talented team I'd ever been around. We went through the season undefeated and came up short against Penn State in the Fiesta Bowl. Coming off the disappointment from the year prior, we all had a mission that, you know, at hand and we wanted to complete it, and that was to be national champs. Coming off that loss against Penn State, that gave us a, a bad taste in our mouth. And we kind of mauled Penn State and didn't come out with the win. And I know, I know it, it, was, uh, it was devastating to Jimmy. Probably the most devastating loss that I ever had in my entire coaching career. To come up short in Penn State the way we did, uh, our pride was on the line. I think it gave our entire team some resolve to go out there and not to let it happen again. There was a lot of, you know, wanting to make it perfect the next time. We wanted to redeem ourselves. In 87, you know, it was a matter of us pressing on. That was the theme going into 87, it was about pressing on. We knew we had nothing else to play for but for the national championship. They said, what's this team going to do without Tester Verde and Jerome Brown and Mo? Jimmy was thinking it was a little bit rebuilding year. Going into 87, we knew we had a very talented team, but, you know, we had to replace our quarterback and replace some other players. All of a sudden, half of your starters are first-year starters. You just wondered, replacing that many guys, you know, how we were going to be. The people picking the teams, you know, they didn't think that we would be up there for the national championship pitcher. We had three guys drafted in the first nine picks in 80, from the 86 team. We were still loaded on defense. I think the concern for 87 was the offense, particularly the offensive line, which was decimated by seniors graduating. And we lost, like I said, so, many, so much of a nucleus. We were um, a good team. We didn't have as many athletes as that 86 team, but I knew we were still very competitive. Spend half the summer training, working together as a unit. Sometimes we have 30 guys going up to the hill, running and working out. Nobody trained harder than us, nobody conditioned harder than us. We practiced so hard, man. You guys just have no idea how hard our practices were because our coaches wanted perfection. As a freshman, just being on the scout team, I mean, I, I didn't travel, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't participate in any of this stuff as far as the away games, but the intensity in practice was just, it was second to none because Coach Johnson wanted to get that elusive national championship. We weren't cocky and we were confident. Preparation breeds confidence. I didn't mind them being cocky. I didn't mind them celebrating. I didn't allow them to have penalties. You know, I didn't allow them to have a 15-yard penalty because they knew if that happened, then they were going to catch my wrath. Discipline is not saying don't enjoy the victory after you have bust your butt all week. No one worked us like Coach Johnson. No one worked like we worked on that practice field. There's a misconception about swagger. You know, some, some people like to look at swagger as being overconfident. Um, not respecting your opponents in the game. But swagger is obtained from Sunday to Friday. You just wanted to make sure your guys were taking part and doing the right things to, uh, to, get, to get us to win them all. We had a 15-yard route. It was a 15-yard route. That's the discipline that we showed. If you had to get that block, you got that block. It was a commitment. Each man, a promise made. Each man, one to the other. I will get my job done today. That's discipline. There was nobody else in the country practicing or going after each other the way we did. So we knew that nobody on Saturday could compete with us. We had a chance to play and practice every day against the best. Offensively, we had great receivers. We had Michael Irvin and Brett Perriman and Brian Blades, uh, good, talented senior running backs and Melvin Bratt and Warren Williams. You know, we, we had a lot of athletes and a lot, of, a lot of talent. On the defensive side, we had Dan Stubbs, who would scare any quarterback out of their, out of their jersey. Uh, Benny Blades was outstanding. And a guy named Rod Carter, who hit so hard, he actually broke one of our players' jaw in practice. 
we were competing in practice to, to not only get a job, but to hold your job. And, it, and there were so many good players that the competition was fierce. And, and what we didn't know is that when those guys left, they had worked so hard and been so tough that they created, uh, you know, the guys that were there were ready, ready to fill in the gaps. A lot better than we thought they were going to. The fun part about the season was I'm thinking I'm going in to be a defensive end. We had some defensive tackle issues. Jimmy one day comes to me and tells me, uh, asked me actually, uh, do you think you can play defensive tackle? And I'm thinking, well, I'm not gonna say no to Jimmy Johnson, okay? <laughs> you, don't, you just don't say no. But we were concerned about quarterback and there was a, a battle I think in camp that year. Most people thought, how could they find another quarterback after winning a championship with Bernie Kozar, he left, getting to that Penn State championship game with Vinny Testaverde, and then he leaves, and everybody was wondering who's next. We were wondering if the skinny kid from Minnesota was going to do any good. I always tell people my biggest concerns was my teammates because I didn't want to let them down. I knew how talented we were, and uh, heck, these, these guys were big and mean, and, and uh, I didn't want to let them down. I wanted to make sure that I did everything I could to the best of my ability to put us in a position to win. I spent that whole summer, I moved to Minnesota with the quarterback, Steve Walsh. I said we would train all summer long, preparing for this season. You know, I was sick as a dog. I'd throw up before every game, and, and I remember sitting under the uh, tunnel, leaning over the fence between the two locker rooms, and, you know, a towel around my neck and just not feeling very good, and Melvin Bratton coming up, putting his arm around me and say, come on, Walsh, you'll be okay. As we found out in that very first game against Florida, we had nothing to worry about. Here comes Charlton. A shovel pass forward to Bratton. Up for the first down, a heads-up play by the third-year sophomore quarterback, Steve Walsh. I still recall Benny standing up in the locker room saying, okay, we got our quarterback. Walsh, good protection in the end zone. Coverage is there. The ball is caught by Brian Blades. Even though the coverage by Watkins was there, it's a touchdown, Miami. Big snap to Bell, nice grab. And Bell goes down at the 40. It's his old friend, Danny Stubbs, his 31st career sack. And man, then we went out and just started winning games and, and said, hey man, this is kind of fun. These guys are good, they're getting it. This game is over. Miami, 31, Florida, four. When it was time to play, when the lights came on, we were ready. There was no doubt about us being ready. The coaches made sure of that. There was no opponent that we feared when Saturday came because we knew that we were well prepared and well pe prepped to play anybody in college football. I think University of Miami back during that period of time was really misunderstood. Number one, from the haters because they didn't like us winning so many games. Uh, but number two, because of our swagger. The mistake they were making was they were calling having fun being undisciplined. We had a group of guys that were very uh, eclectic to say the least. They knew what they were getting into when they were bringing us into the University of Miami. They were really trying to change a culture, to do something that hadn't been done before, to put the university on the map. Some inner city kids, some from broken homes, some without parents. He knew we were guys that were at risk guys and they took a chance on us. And we did not want to let him down nor the other teammates down. They were good individuals. You know, they got their degrees. They were going to class. They were doing things the right way. I wanted our guys to grow into being men with college degrees to get ready for the rest of their life. Jimmy did a good job of not trying to change or take that edge off, but he embraced that edge and he was able to harness that and use that energy that could have been a disaster for the university. And I wasn't going to keep my thumb on them to restrict you know, their flamboyance and to restrict you know, their swagger. Taught us to be disciplined. He didn't talk down to us. He wanted us to come up to a standard that he had set for us. And that was huge because no one else had ever done that for us. I told him, I said, listen, we're gonna do it the right way. We're not gonna have penalties. We're gonna work hard. 
we're gonna do it the right way, but I don't mind you being yourself. He was the guy that brought all of that together and helped us understand that, that we could be special and we can do something uh, that's never been done before. And I think because we had so many players from so many different walks of life, I think it kind of molded them into a team. And so our guys embraced the swagger. They embraced being the best. One of the ways we got through practice, um, thinking of dances and, and high fives and who can do the smoothest uh, move. And it helped us to compete against one another in practice and, and it carried over into the games. It's a party atmosphere. Should be a great ball game. Number seven, Miami against 10th ranked Arkansas. What a great team Miami has been on the road over the years. But you have to remember that their sophomore quarterback, Steve Walsh, has never started a game on the road before. They were winning games. Not only were they winning games, they were beating teams decisively. And then I caught a lot of criticism for that because they said I ran up the score. We went out and we played as well as we could play. And we played as well as we could play for the entire 60 minutes. So that meant we probably ran up the score on some. First down and more. What a great cut he might go all the way. Williams, touchdown Miami. Not only were our players misunderstood, our approach was misunderstood. They had an excellent game plan offensively and defensively, and this has got to be one of the most lopsided victories you could ever expect. Arkansas came in undefeated and ranked 10th, and Miami simply blew them away. Going against the schedule that we had, and it was brutal, uh, some of the teams that we had to play on the road. The Florida State game was a defining moment. Number three, the Hurricanes of Miami take on number four, the Seminoles of Florida State. It's going to take all of us to beat that team in garnet and gold. They're, they're as good as it gets, and we, we're, we're going to have to fight them and fight them, and there's no way we're losing. The atmosphere was incredible. We'll have a crowd in excess of 63,000 watching today in a game that will carry ramifications as far as the national championship is concerned. We were in for the fight of our lives. Sweet crap. He cannot get the corner. Deion Sanders, the All-American corner, was there to hold him down, and they exchanged pleasantries. He had heard he was All-American caliber, but he has been great. Oh, tremendous defensive play by Bill Hawkins, number 54. They had a, a great game plan on the offensive side of the ball, so they were controlling the clock. Great run by Smith. He breaks free. Goodbye. Oh, a tremendous tackle. He caught him. We weren't getting a lot of opportunities in that first half. I really struggled. We struggled running the ball. There wasn't a whole lot we could do. The fullback has been the short yardage first man for the Seminoles. Here he comes, behind the middle of the line with a second effort for the score. We got down in the game, and, and we could have quit then, you know, but there was no quitting these guys. I was pissed off at halftime. I kind of got up in halftime and, and kind of gave Gave the, the defense a fit and say, man, you guys, let's get it going. I was, I was psyched. I was pumped up. And they power Bennett for the first down. Bennett to the 46-yard line with Selwyn Brown bringing him down. And now temper is starting to flare down on the field. Ebb and flow is important in any football game. Well, the momentum has switched over to Miami side. Between the third and the fourth quarter, interesting that every player on the Miami sideline put up four fingers and saluted every other player. They, and I asked them what it meant, they say, we win in the fourth quarter. Florida State with the wind at their back. McManus to put it up. Intercepted. Intercepted by Danny Stubbs. The big man comes up with the key turnover. The play that everybody thinks about is the one that Mike caught down the sidelines. Here it's 19 all, 2.30 to go. Miami with possession. Steve lines up. I go wide right. We got a 10-yard out call. A 10-yard out. All we were looking for is another first down. And a third down. All those moments I spent with Steve Walsh in Minnesota, and all the times we had worked on those hand signals, it was for the moment like this. Urban's got it. Urban's free. Urban's gone. Touchdown, Miami. 
And I remember the coaches running down the sideline with Mike. It was a kind of a signature game, you know, for the Miami Hurricanes. We were bound and determined we weren't going to get beat. And now it comes down to this. You'll watch the play and you'll see what happened. No good. The gamble fails in Tallahassee. It was when we knew that, you know, sometimes it, it may take luck, but if you keep fighting, good things will happen for you. So Mel Bratton and the Hurricanes stage a dramatic comeback here in Tallahassee. It was the final moment that basically portrayed us all season. We persevered, we counted on one another, we never gave up, and in the end, we came out victorious. That set the precedent for our season. And anybody else that got in our way during that season didn't have it, just didn't stand a chance. Now time for the big one, the battle for the national championship between Oklahoma and Miami. High drama at the Orange Bowl. The number one ranked Oklahoma Sooners, that'll be the only team successful against them in the past three seasons, the number two ranked Miami Hurricanes. There in the Orange Bowl against Oklahoma, you know, we were probably as confident as we've ever been in any big game. The coaches did a great job all week because I had no clue that they were the necessarily the number one defense because the way the coaches talked about them, you know, they, they had never seen an offense like us. And, and they pointed it out very, very well on film about the teams that they played. Look at this. They don't know how to protect. They don't know how to throw concepts. Even though after all the things that we had accomplished, they put that team ahead of us. There really wasn't any doubt in my mind that we were going to win that ball game against Oklahoma and win the national championship. For the simple reason, I knew how prepared our team was. I knew how hard they had worked. And I knew that we were the better team. We were brainwashed, if you will, that there was no way they were going to stop us. The Hurricanes are on the drive. First down, and here's Walsh dropping to throw, looping it down towards the end zone. There's speed going for the ball. It is caught by Melvin Bratton out of the backfield, but there's a penalty marker down at the line of scrimmage. And that's against Oklahoma. 12 men on the field. A touchdown counts. Six yards. Greg Cox, the senior place kicker from Fort Lauderdale, gives the Hurricanes the lead. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. If they don't make it on third down. Catch, and Thompson hits his All-American tight end. Fumble. And then after he gets the ball, Keith Jackson loses it. With 47 seconds to play. Miami 20, Oklahoma 14. Whatever trick play they got here, it better be at the end. They got on that hook and ladder. Pitch it back. They can't do anything. He fumbled, he he fumbled. They do, and this is history. The Hurricanes, an underdog, will win a national championship again, this time under Coach Jimmy Johnson. Got it, got him. The score doesn't really properly reflect how badly we beat them. More than anything else, it was relief that we, we got it done. To do it with a perfect season is special, and that was the first one at the University of Miami. We brought home the ring, and we brought it home with the third quarterback that no one thought could happen. Winning that championship um, brought the city closer together. Well, the 87 team, it meant the world to me. I think the legacy was to carry on the tradition of excellence and to fight 
It's the fight inside the player. And when you come together, you don't have to have the superstars to have success. You just need to fight as a team. There are a lot of people around the country that didn't want to like Miami. They didn't want to give us credit. We started a fad. It was pretty much us against the world. We knew that we had to win a title in order to be respected. I don't think anybody, anybody can understand the abuse that we took. Even though the country didn't like it, we changed a complete culture. Kids now want to be like that 87 championship team. We danced, we showboated, and college football wasn't used to seeing that. The whole uh, country looked at a bunch of misfits, were able to come together and do something special to not only change college football, but to give a vision, a larger vision to kids out of the communities in which we came out of, a vision to say, okay, if, if those guys can do it, we can do it. Our guys were student athletes. And when I say student athletes, they got their degrees. And so I think that's one reason why there was a lot of misconception about those Miami teams. It gave high school kids in that area an opportunity to say, hey, I want to go to the U. Um, they're special. If the University of Miami had not taken a chance on kids out of the hood, you know, how many kids would have been lost in the trenches? Part, to, to me, of the fabric of what the U was all about. You've created something special by the way you practice, by the way you compete, and by your team unity, and you can go go accomplish something like 12 and 0. Stacking that on top of the 80, 83 season really kind of set Miami up as a, as a power to, to be reckoned with through the 80s and 90s. It set us apart. Um, it gave us uh, a bragging right to keep kids in South Florida and to come all over the country to, to a special university. It gave a lot of kids hope to say, wow, if those guys could come out of my neighborhood and do something like that and make it to the next level, then I have a shot. I, I really think we had a huge impact on a lot of kids that wherever they went, whether they came to the University of Miami, they did want to emulate who we were. I think when you look at University of Miami during that period of time, it's one of the great football teams in the history of college football.